Thanks for clicking on Wayne.com for this week's edition of Inside the Zone. Justin Kenny here, as always, from Optima Performance Sports this week. And uh, we got to talk a lot about teams playing teams from outside the area. I mean, yep. last week it was like everybody versus everybody. Sectional championships abound. Mm -hmm. uh, we had seven of those, so seven teams moving on. And uh, really, as great as last week's schedule was, everybody yep. was kind of close to home, close to Fort Wayne. It was, it was nice. For made you a nice Friday night for you? It made it the, the easiest night of sectional finals we've ever had. Now, logistically the most difficult. <laughs> like, everybody's on the road. The closest yeah. game is Kendallville, which is 40 minutes away. The second closest game is Tipton. Um, yeah, that, that almost feels like a short road trip. So Oof. we're going to be hitting the road. I imagine you're going to be hitting the road. Yeah. Um, before we get into the games, what are you most looking forward to this week? And what of the teams left that are still alive surprise you? Other than the fact that a couple weeks ago we thought Southwood was out completely. And right. now they're playing for a regional championship. And now they're back, right? So um, I think Bishop Bluers. Um, mm -hmm. Being a lot, I, I know people will say, "Well, you shouldn't overlook the SAC schedule and all that." But considering how deep that sectional was, for them to show out the way they did over the course of three games to win that sectional, I think was very impressive. Looking back, you say, "Yeah, I could see the signs there," but you know they didn't have any marquee wins really in the regular season, mm -hmm. and they had to play some really tough teams: Fairfield on the road. East side at home, but for them to come together and get a, a sectional championship was pretty impressive. If I had to say a surprise, I'd say the Knights. All right. We'll get into that more in a little bit. I want to talk yeah. about Carson Clark, talk about Brody Glenn, their matchup problems, all that kind of stuff. But let's start. Uh, well, normally we start with 6A, but let's start with 1A because we Ooh, do have okay. two local teams playing in this. It's going to be our highlight zone game of the week. And as I saw, I think it was Coach Mosher that pointed out on Twitter earlier today, these are not counting Elkhart, who's just played this past season, and they're 9-0, they're I believe. Um, these are the two winningest programs in the state. In the last two years, best winning percentage. Yeah, both of them undefeated going into this one. Both of them double-digit wins, I believe, last season. Um, and just the one loss in the postseason. So, what do you see happening in this one? Because uh, Southwood on the road last week took care of business against Adam Central in a game that was, was tied in the second half. They yep. won by two touchdowns. It all comes down to Southwood's defense. And until somebody slows that South Adams offense down... That's the key to the game. Every time you play the Starfires is, can you match up with the playmakers for South Adams? I'm not sure Southwood can. I They struggled a little bit last week with that running attack of Adams Central. Made the plays when they needed to, for sure. But they're gonna South Adams is going to spread it out on Friday. They're going to come out three, four, five wide, and they're going to test you vertically. And do you have the personnel to match up? If it becomes a, a offensive slugfest, a big scoring game, I don't see how Southwood can, can win this one. They need to be able to contain South Adams, not entirely, but enough to keep the game from getting into the 40s. What If you're Southwood, though, uh, Elijah Sutton really burst um, onto the scene, if you will, last game in the second half. He had three yeah. touchdowns all in the second half, 217 yards on the ground. If you're Southwood, a couple of those were, were big runs. One was Two of them were 60-plus. One was yeah. a 20-yard run. Um, so it wasn't like long, sustained drives. But if you're Southwood... The key, I think, is maybe keeping the ball away and having those 10, 12 play right. drives and scoring yeah. on those to keep the ball out of South Adams' hands. If you can't slow them down defensively, at least try to limit the opportunities right. that they have. Yeah, that's the key is scoring on those drives too, right? It doesn't help if you're, if you're using up six, seven, eight minutes off the clock if you don't score. It's probably detrimental. Yeah, absolutely. So it definitely needs to be a case where Southwood needs to control this tempo of this game, uh, particularly offensively. And try to keep the ball away from, from the Starfires, which is easily said and done. And then when they get the ball, are you stopping them? Because we've seen teams like Carroll and South Adams that could put up points quickly, mm -hmm. almost too quick sometimes. I think in Carroll's respect, they would run into their defense being fatigued because the yeah. offense would score so quick. Um, so I feel that's a, a big thing is if you can limit South Adams' big plays, but and they just continue to make it look easy It'll be more difficult against an undefeated Southwood team, but until I see them get some stops, I'm going to Starfires. I want to ask you about this. I don't know if you had talked to Coach Mosher over the weekend. What if you the philosophy of him with the throwback on the opening kick? I mean, yeah. just went for the jugular <laughs> right out of the gate. I I loved it. Yeah. Um, but you could see 
I guess they probably saw it on tape yeah. where the other team used kind of a bunch formation Which, to kick. Yeah. And I saw it, and before I even saw the ball, I was like, well, you can do something right here. <laughs> and then I saw him do it, and I was like, ah, oh, that makes sense. I, I would assume that their coaching staff identified that on yeah. tape, and that was something that they decided to put into the game plan. Not something that was in their, their bag of tricks necessarily at the beginning, but something that they scouted and saw. They did. So talking to Coach Mosier, so we saw it on tape. I don't know why a team would do that, yeah. bunched up towards the kicker. And they said that was in our game plan all week. It worked to perfection. And for all intents and purposes, the game was over after that. But yeah. I don't expect that easy of a matchup for South Adams coming up on Friday. Oh, I, was, I remember looking at the film and like, huh, they're really bunched up on that. Like I thought maybe they would fan out before the yeah. kick, but no, they, they all stuck together. And then they threw it back. I was like, ha, ha. They must be doing this every week. So there you go. Great, uh, great minds. Yeah. Really great minds think alike. Let's move on to the two-way game. Um, you touched on Bishop Lures already, yeah. but um, as you mentioned, they didn't really have that, that, that signature win, if you will, um, or that signature two, three weeks where they were just hot in the regular season, although they played better towards the end. Yeah. Um, what is it that's allowed them to really hit the ground running uh, I use that literally, but they're really passing because yeah. you've seen the way that Carson Clark has emerged over 300, almost 350 yards, six touchdowns, four of them to Brody Glenn. I mean, what is it that's uh, allowing Kyle Lindsay's team, especially offensively, to really click in the postseason? Because they've been playing well defensively at times, and then they get into shootout with Eastside and BD right. side that way as well. I think the inconsistency with Bishop Lures over the last couple of years has been quarterback play, and they just did not have a quarterback that could lead this team offensively and make all the plays they needed to make. We've seen different guys in different situations over the last couple of years at Bishop Lures behind center. None of them have been able to settle in and lead this team. Carson Clark has been able to do that the second half of this year. We saw him show flashes earlier in the year, but has really grown comfortable. 16 touchdowns, zero interceptions over the last five games for Carson Clark. He has emerged as not just a stat king on that team, but also a leader, very mature in his junior season. And I think that is, is the difference, I feel, for Bishop Lures. It's not like they're really stopping teams. They did Fairfield, but, you know, Eastside was able to put up 49 points. But that offense is able to put up points. They're able to keep up with teams where, as this time last year, Bishop Lures just had trouble scoring points. And that doesn't seem to be the case this year especially late, and I think the primary reason is Carson Clark. I, the funny thing about Carson Clark is he's kind of flown under the radar because we always talk about who is the best quarterback in the SAC. Is it Deuce? Is it Becker? And I was looking at the stats this week and across the state. He's like top 10 in the state in passing yards this season, yeah. over 2,000 yards. Maybe he's just maybe we're just not paying attention enough. Right, and, and it comes down to when he's performing, too, That's in the true. clutch. And he's really kind of – it's just clicked for him the last four or five weeks, and, and it's really led this team going forward. You know, before he would just go with his first read, throw into coverage, sometimes to be picked, sometimes to be a bad throw. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was interesting talking to him after the game on Friday, throws six touchdown passes, runs for another, mm -hmm. and all he wants to talk about are the two, two plays he missed. Uh, you know, oh, man, I just missed this pass or this read. I mean, he thrives on his imperfections in terms of not settling. And I don't think that was the case with, with Carson Clark last year. I think he thought mm. it would come easy mm. uh, in years past, but this year he's put in the work. He's paying dividends for the night. It's a lot like my wife. She thrives on my imperfections. So <laughs> Very similar. Very similar. Um, it's a very short list, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, the one thing I guess that concerns me most about Tipton as an opponent is how they handled Eastbrook. Yes. Um, and as we've talked in weeks past, when it comes to 2A, you can be pretty good, but a lot of it comes down to on this half of the state, Getting to Indianapolis means you have to get through Eastbrook and mm -hmm. the way that Coach Adams runs that offense, a trip to Eastbrook. Like, yeah. th that was the team it's to the get nat, through yeah. mm -hmm. until you do it. Um, and this Tipton team, although they struggled last week a bit with LaPel, yeah. they got through Eastbrook the week before that. So what are your concerns about what Tipton presents? Because obviously they're a worthy opponent. They're mm -hmm. still alive, and they've beaten somebody that had state title aspirations already, much yeah. like Eastside did right. when Lures beat them last week. And dropped 56 on Eastbrook, yeah. too, in that win. So that's the, the eye-opening part is how they beat East, Eastbrook. And the Panthers, Eastbrook loves to do what they do, and you cannot stop it. But Tipton was able to find a way to do that and be out-physical out Eastbrook at the point of attack when they were on offense. The benefit for Bishop Lures is they have different personnel than Eastbrook. If they were coming into this game and they were a power-running team 
and they didn't pass very often, then you'd say, okay, advantage Tipton based on what they did against Eastbrook. But considering Bishop Lures his personnel, considering the offense they run, they hurry it up a little bit when they can. They spread the field. They'll attack you with Brody Glenn over the top. Ramon Anderson has played tremendously well in the absence of Sir Hale. And you feel, you know, Nick Thompson has stepped up mm-hmm. to in that slot. And I feel, okay, that is a good enough matchup to me on paper to say Bishop Lures can go on the road and get a win. It's not going to be easy, mm-hmm. but I like the matchup for the Knights, and it gives them a shot. Yeah. John Harrells has tipped in plus one. I think it was like 24-23. So he's got a slight favorite to Tipton. I'm assuming that's probably because it's a home game for Tipton. Yeah, sure. Um, let's move on to 3A. Uh, Concordia, they got their work cut out for them. Um, they go to uh, top-ranked Chittard. Yes. Chittard's 10-1. and They played a tough schedule. They beat Burbuff, who's a solid football team, a mm-hmm. solid football program last week, 35-3, second time this season that they've beaten Burbuff. Chittard, we mentioned, uh, just mentioned that Tipton was a one-point favorite. Right. Harrells has... Um, Chittard is a 14-point favorite, 14-point mm. favorite, so a two-touchdown favorite against Concordia. That said, Concordia's playing their best football of the season. Um, I was impressed. I did not think with Eli Riley, Max Ringer, and all those guys that they were going to be able yeah. to shut out Norwell last week, but that's what they did. Before we throw shade, or I throw shade on Concordia in this week, let's give them props, like you said last Friday. Being able to shut out Norwell in the way they did was as impressive as anything we saw last Friday night. Considering how dangerous that Norwell offense has been throughout most of the season, we knew Concordia's defense was good, but it was just the latest example of going, wow, this team is legit on that side of the football. And even the offense looked pretty good. We say, oh, it stutters at times, but they played very well last week as well. But Chatard is on another level, a completely different animal from Norwell or anybody else Concordia has played in the playoffs. Number one team in the state. They play tough competition down there. Uh, It's going to be very, very difficult for Concordia to go down there and get a victory. I I would think this is a game where last week we saw a lot of the offense dictated by Cam Johnson making a couple of plays at receiver for, for, uh, you know, big touchdown catches. Um, I imagine Chatard is going to see that on tape and try to take him away and make Brandon Davis run the football, make Amir Drew run the football, which generally that, that's worked out pretty well sure, for Concordia. Yeah. Again, as you mentioned, this is a different animal. How much does uh, Brandon Davis and that offense have to make sure that they get the ball around to a number of receivers? Because I imagine they watched the tape last week, and they're going to be trying to bottle up Cam Johnson. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And I think that could be the difference. Guys like Cam Johnson, a big kickoff return here, uh, a, an interception or a turnover there. Uh, some short fields, being able to get those positions for Concordia. That's what it's going to come down to. I don't think an even game over 48 minutes, Concordia can win this one unless some things go right for them. So I feel like special teams are going to be key in this one, particularly early. You mm-hmm. cannot allow Chatard to get ahead by a couple scores because then I think you can count this, this game over. So Concordia needs to uh, get off to a fast start, maybe a quick score or two, hang around, see what they can do in the fourth. All right, we got East Noble at Mary or Marion rather at East Noble yeah. in 4A. Um, that one's going to be a 7:30 kick. I saw. Yes. Um, that was it's our only one that isn't starting at seven o'clock. Um, when you take a look at Marion, obviously, you know, going and playing Delta last week. Delta's a good team. That's a good mm-hmm. win for them. Yes, it is. Um, they did have a little bit of trouble. Southside hung with them for a little mm-hmm. while the week before. Uh, East Noble, I think, if you'd have told me at this point. A year ago, the East Noble will be back in a yeah. regional championship game. I say, like, no, they graduated yeah. Bailey Parker. They graduated Hayden Jones, uh, Leith al Mahamadawi. Like, they have, they're not going to have enough coming back yeah. to be here. But yet, here they are. Here they are. Got it done last week. Turnabout's fair play. Shutting out Leo after the Lions shut them out in the regular season. Very impressive with what that East Noble defense was, gonna, was able to do. Now it has a different test defensively. Whereas Leo was really going to pack the box in that, in that uh, T formation and try to counter and wishbone their ways into, to, into scores, Marion wants to spread you out and attack you and get around the, the edge. And so that's a completely different challenge for East Noble. But I feel they've faced enough teams in the regular season to prepare for, for this kind of offense. Teams like New Haven that are really, uh, they can grasp, okay, the principles of playing New Haven and uh, apply them to Marion. I think it's a step up in competition from the Bulldogs. But mm-hmm. I feel like East Noble has the personnel and the scheme to slow down Marion enough to get a win. I think... As an outsider looking in, people would say, well, Marion's got speed, they got athleticism, they got quickness. To me, that discounts what you've seen from East Noble. Zolman yeah. has that. Uh, yeah. Munson has that. Van Gorder can make plays. Marcellus has that a little yeah. bit. Like, 
they do have guys that have speed. They're not just like... We've heard the, the phrase roughneck is what right. uh, East Noble says, where they're going to ground and pound and beat you up on the line. Like, mm, they have skills. Yeah. They have speed. They have quickness. Like, yeah. it isn't just, here are these big burly dudes from Kentlerville and these speedy, quick athletes from Marion. Like, East Noble's more balanced than that. Right, yeah. And you look at the Penn game in particular. Now, Penn isn't super athletic where they're going all over the field. It's not what the Kingsmen do. But when we watched that game, it wasn't like East Noble was completely outclassed in that game right. or speed or strength or physicality. They matched up with Penn. So I don't see a problem with Marion coming in and how Marion plays for Coach Amstutz to say, okay, we can take this away and this away. And after last week, I feel like they're playing particularly their good best football of the year. That's mm -hmm. obvious. And I feel like the matchups um, really play into East Noble's strengths. Yeah, and East Noble has really won a couple of slugfests. You're talking yeah. about 10-0 against Leo, and you forget how close the uh, DeKalb game was the week yeah. before, and they haven't had that big yeah. offensive blow. So they're, they're winning sort of in different ways than they did last year. So uh, consider me impressed is what I'm yes, saying. Yes, I would um, agree. Graduating everybody that they did last year, and here we are again still talking about East Noble. Uh, 5A, Bishop Dwenger is at a well-rested Zionsville team. They are. Uh, a Zionsville team that would have played McCutcheon, but McCutcheon got COVIDed out. I'm just the betting words word. here. COVID it out of, of the postseason, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so when you take a look at this Zionsville matchup, five and five, they play a good schedule. How do you see this one playing out? Because it's such an X factor. We don't really know what level Zionsville is at. If uh, look, I, I think Zionsville is a very good team, but Bishop DeWanger is better. That's, that's not very good insight whatsoever. But, uh, you know, Zionsville is going to bring what they like to do into this game. But I feel like when you look at the matchups and you look at Zionsville, and I haven't gone in depth yet with Zionsville, but when you look at their wins and losses, and you're pointing out teams that Dwenger's better, Dwenger's better, Dwenger's better. It's, it's, it's a difficult schedule, but I don't think it prepared them enough to prepare them to beat Bishop Dwenger. You were thinking along the same lines that I was because I, I looked at their schedule, three and four in the Hoosier Crossroads Conference. Here's who finished ahead of them in that. Yeah. Westfield, all right. Okay. Um, Brownsburg, okay. Hamilton Southeastern and Avon. Yeah. You're, would you put, if you could put Bishop Dwanger in that conference, would they finish above any of those teams is how I looked at it. I think at least, I think at least Avon this year and maybe even Hamilton Southeast. Right. So, and, and, and I'm sure Jason Garrett right now is yelling at his TV or yeah. his computer saying, you put us number one. We can take Brownsburg and Westfield. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, that's the thing. You're looking at it and going, and then you kind of glance at their, their stats and go, I don't see where this is going to work out for DeWanger, or excuse me, for Zionsville, other than if DeWanger's uh, flat. And I could say, I definitely could say if DeWanger struggled with energy last Friday night against in the first half. In the yeah. first half. I think you're getting to a point where you're playing with fire if you do that in regional and semi-state, and especially state. But I feel like maybe last week was that wake-up call. Maybe last week was that we already beat them once. We're not fired up for Northside much until the second half. And, but I don't think that's the case this Friday night. I think DeWanger is able to go on the road and win. I even think kind of convincingly. I was surprised. Harold's had Zionsville by one in yeah. this game. Uh, again, much like Lures Tipton, I imagine that they give them the slight advantage simply because it's a home game. Right, yeah. But I was surprised that that was the case, which is why I did a little, little bit of a deeper dive into the schedule. If, if Zionsville was playing a team out of the NE8 or something where we said, okay, you know, schedule, strength of schedule mattered on both sides, I would say maybe Zionsville. But look who Dwanger beat over the course of the season. The, the, the sectional, or the, excuse me, the conference that they played in. Four sectional champions in the SAC. They're much more tested with wins over quality opponents than Zionsville. Yeah, I just, I think Dwanger goes better than three and four in that conference. Is yes. The way I just yes, look at I it. I agree. Uh, let's talk about 6A, our final matchup. You've got uh, a Homestead team coming off a solid win against Warsaw last week, and you've got that Homestead team taking on Westfield. We kind of Figured that this, this might be the matchup, yeah. um, or whoever came out of our area would have to face yeah. Westfield to continue their season at Westfield on Friday night. How do you see this one playing out? Because, um, you know, when it comes to 6A, it's been tough for our local mm -hmm. teams, you know, the Snyders and whatnot, and the Homesteads when they get to play the Carmels and the yeah. Westfields and things like that. How do you see this one playing out? Obviously, Westfield's number two in the state. They're a favorite to win this game. But Homestead, we've, after they lost that first game uh, in week one, we've kind of been like, eh, and all they've done is win. Yeah, right. I mean, 
Here's how I approach this one, and it's similar to Notre Dame Clemson on Saturday night. And Notre Dame had a long history of not being able to compete against the upper echelon, the elite teams in college football. They were able to do that, so we're proven wrong. But until that happened, I wasn't buying in. Similar to 6A locally, until a team from the area beats a powerhouse in 6A, I'm going to have my doubts. And Westfield is a powerhouse this year, ranked number two. I mean, people were kind of relieved that that, that uh, Carmel fed into the south this year. Mm-hmm. Westfield's just Carmel North, basically, this year. So the problem is Homestead going on the road and playing a Westfield team at their, their complex there that is amazing and, and being able to limit Maximus Webster, who's their dual threat guy, has thrown for, I think, 21 touchdowns. Offensively, they're going to be at, at the biggest challenge that they have faced all year. And they got some hulking guys defensively. They got a defensive end that's being recruited by Alabama, folks. I mean, this is. Is a, that good? Is that, that is good. It is the biggest test that Homestead will face all season long. No disrespect to anybody in the SAC, but it's fact. When you take a look at them on paper, these are two similar teams statistically. Homestead's scoring about 36 points a game. Westfield's scoring 35. Homestead's giving up about 18. Westfield's giving up about 16. Um, so just mathematically, they yeah. seem to be on the same page, if you will, there. Uh, but Homestead's Evan Orms, who we've talked about, the evolution that we've seen from him, um, how he's gotten better seemingly every week. Right. Um, but... Uh, Nate Anderson is going to be the guy, much like with Cam Johnson, I imagine um, the Westfield Shamrocks have seen the tape. Yeah, I would imagine. And do not want to let a receiver who's already gone over 1,000 yards for the season behind their defense because that's where Nate Anderson seems to live. Right, yeah. And I think that could be the key Friday night is being able to keep Evan Ormsby upright, keeping him protected in the pocket, and allow Nate Anderson, Jared Kissler, and those receivers to get downfield to make some plays vertically because we've seen Evan Ormsby in that offense being able to do it so long throughout this course of the season. I feel like that could be the key. I think Homestead defense, as good as it is, will struggle to keep Westfield off the scoreboard. And so Homestead has to be able to answer offensively. The key is protecting Evan Ormsby, allow him to make plays. The one You mentioned the defense. You know, Luke Palmer's played a lot of football. He's obviously a quality football player. Ryan yeah. Burton played a lot of football. You mentioned having a dual-threat quarterback. I, I would have some confidence because Homestead has so much experience at the right. linebacker. I mean, Burton started since he was like a freshman, if I yeah. remember. And those two guys kind of run in the defense. They'll be disciplined. Sure. And they'll hopefully be able to, to limit when you have a dual-threat quarterback. But uh, how do they make sure that everybody else around them yeah. does the same thing? And that's, that's one of the benefits in talking to Coach Tim Manigo at Concordia last week. And he said, you know, we have to, to, to face a dual threat in Eli Riley. But playing the guys they had played helped them. Playing mm. Becker, playing Deuce Taylor, those guys that really challenged them. Same with Bishop Lures when they had to face Laban Davis last Friday. They say, hey, this is familiar when we're watching tape, right? Yeah. We've faced quarterbacks like this. So I think Homestead can match up when you look at Maximus Webster. It's just that defensive front, that offensive front staying with the speedsters on the edges. That's a different level of football, 6A, when we get into the regional round. Not saying Homestead can't keep up, but it's the biggest challenge they faced all year, and we haven't seen a 6A team from the area being able to answer a challenge like this yet since 6A was in existence. This is true. This is true. (laughs) All these things are true. But the big question is, what are you most looking forward to about this week? I mean, a lot of these teams are teams we thought could make a run in the postseason, and they're still here. When you look at the schedule, I think there are a couple games that we go, that's going to be tough, that's going to be tough, and that's Homestead at Westfield and Concordia at Chittard. But everything else you're saying, I see a scenario where this team wins, this team wins. I mean, is it inconceivable that we have four teams playing in semi-state next week? Could we have an upset somewhere we have even five? I mean, it could buck the trend a little bit. You know, usually we're worried about two or three. But I see a road to at least four next week, and that would be exciting and stressful for you, sir, on how you're going to cover all those. Yes, it would be. But hopefully they would be closer to home. I yes, looked at all the brackets, so. but I can't imagine with this week, with almost everybody being on the road, that this wouldn't yeah. be a more home-friendly schedule. Let's hope. Next Friday, whatever happens, we're going to have it covered. This Friday in the Highlight Zone, next Friday, we'll, we'll be out there. We'll be doing it. <laughs> He's Justin Kenny from Ops. I'm Glenn Marini, and we'll see you next Monday talking Inside the Zone.